from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, bringing you data-driven insights from the Cube and ETR. This is Breaking Analysis with Dave Vellante. Uber has one of the most amazing business models ever created. The company's mission is underpinned by technology that helps people go anywhere and get anything. The results have been stunning. In just over a decade, Uber has become a firm with more than $30 billion in annual sales and a market capitalization of nearly 90 billion as of today. Moreover, the company's productivity metrics, when you measure things like revenue per employee, are three to five times greater than what you'd expect to find in a typical technology company. In our view, Uber's technology stack represents the future of enterprise data apps where organizations will essentially create real-time digital twins of their businesses and in doing so, deliver enormous customer value. Hello and welcome to this week's Wikibon Cube Insights powered by ETR. In this breaking analysis, Cube analyst George Gilbert and I will introduce you to one of the architects behind Uber's groundbreaking fulfillment platform. We're going to explore their objectives, the challenges they had to overcome and how Uber has done it. And we believe the company is a harbinger for the future of technology. Now the technical team behind Uber's fulfillment platform went on a two year journey to create what we see as the future of data apps. And it's our distinct pleasure to welcome to the program Uday Kiran Medicetti, who's a distinguished engineer at Uber. And he's led, bootstrapped and scaled major real-time platform initiatives and his time at Uber and has agreed to share how the team actually accomplished this impressive feat of software and networking engineering. Uday, welcome to the program. It's great to see you. Hello, George. All right, Uday, Uday, start if you would, by telling us a little bit about yourself and your role at Uber. Yeah, uh, hi George, hi, uh, hi Dave, uh, super nice to be here. Uh, um, I joined Uber back in uh, 2015 uh, when we were primarily doing on-demand UberX and we were primarily in uh, North America. And over the last eight years, I have witnessed Uber's tremendous growth uh, you know, how we have expanded from on-demand mobility to all kinds of personal mobility, how we have expanded from just mobility to all kinds of delivery. And the mission that you just, just said, go anywhere and get anything. That is the total addressable market of that is insane around the world. And that's what drives us here. And that's what kept me here uh, with the same energy, even after eight years. Uh, so I, have, I, have, I work on the core mobility business and a bunch of foundational business platforms that are leveraged across mobility and delivery. I also lead Uber-wide the senior engineering community where we set best practices so that we can move at the same pace across all of the engineering team across Uber. Um, so yeah, that, that's my quick intro. Yeah, I, I remember the first time I ever used the Uber app, I was stuck in the hinterlands outside of Milan. No, couldn't get a cab. And I said, I'm going to try this Uber thing. And this was like the early part of last decade. And, and I was, I was, it was like my, it was like a chat GPT moment. Now back, back in March, George and I, and just last week as well, introduced the, to the audience, this idea of Uber as the future of enterprise data apps. And we put forth the premise that the future of digital business is going to manifest itself as a digital twin that represents people, places, and things. And that increasingly business logic is going to be embedded into data versus the way it works today. And applications are going to be built from this set of coherent data elements. So when we go back and look at the progression of enterprise apps throughout history, it's, we think it's useful to share where we think we are on this journey. So George put together this graphic to describe the history in simple terms, starting with 1.0, which was departments and back office automation. And then in the orange is the sort of ERP movement where a company like Ford, for example, could integrate all its financials and supply chain and all its internal resources into a coherent set of data and activities that really drove productivity kind of in the 90s. And then Web 2.0 for the enterprise. Here we're talking about using data and machine intelligence in a custom platform to manage an internal value chain and where we're using modern techniques. And we use the, the here the example of amazon.com, not AWS, but the retail side of the operation. And then in the blue, we show enterprise ecosystem apps. Which, this is where we place Uber today. Really one of the first, if not the first, to build a custom platform to manage an external ecosystem. Different, of course, from the gaming industry that we show there on the right-hand side. And our fundamental premise is that what Uber has built, and we're going to get into this because 
Uber is on its own journey, even within that blue ellipse. But our premise is that eventually mainstream companies are going to want to use AI to orchestrate an Uber-like ecosystem experience using packaged off-the-shelf software and services. And so you see most organizations, they don't have a team of Uday's. They can't afford it. They can't attract the talent. So we think this is where the industry is headed. And Uber is a harbinger example. And George, you have a burning question for Uday. So go ahead. So Uday, Uday, it's a big picture question, but it has to do with like helping people like understand not just the, the consumer experience of the app, but the, the architecture of an application that is trying to orchestrate an ecosystem and how different that is from where we've been, which are these packaged apps that manage repeatable processes that were, you know, pretty much almost the same across different businesses with maybe room for customization. It's so radical and, and we are so accustomed to living in it out here in tech bubble land, but tell us, you know, help us understand um, sort of big picture, what a big transformation that is from the, the application's point of view. Yeah, so one of the fascinating things about uh, building any platforms for Uber is how we need to interconnect what's happening in real world and build large scale real time applications that can orchestrate all of this at scale. You know, like um, there is a real person waiting in the real world to get a response from our application, whether they can continue with the next step or not. Um, if you think about our scale, like in the uh, you know, last FIFA World Cup, we had 1.6 million con concurrent consumers interacting with our platform at that point in time. This includes riders, eaters, merchants, drivers, couriers, and all, all of these uh, different entities, they are trying to do things in real world and our applications has to be real time. They need to be consistent. Uh, they need to be performant and we need to be, and on top of all of this, we need to be cost effective at scale uh, because if, we are not performant if you're not leveraging the right set of uh, resources then uh, we can uh, explode our overall cost of uh, managing the infrastructure um, so these are all some unique challenges in building a uber like application um, and uh, we can go into more details on various aspects and uh, both at breadth and also in depth uh, right yeah so uday i mean this vision that you sort of laid out it requires an incredible amount of data to be available, as you said, in, in real time or near real time. Uh, Uday's team, a couple of key blogs that we'll put into the show notes. Uh, I mean, I've probably got seven hours into them and I'm still like going back and <laughs> trying to squint through them. So we really appreciate you sort of up-leveling it here and helping our audience understand it. But what was it about the, the earlier 2014 architecture, you described this in one of your blogs that limited the realization of your mission at scale and catalyze this architectural rewrite. And we're particularly interested in the trade-off that you had to make that you've talked about in your, your paper, your blog, to optimize for availability over consistency. Why was that problematic? And let's talk about how you solved that. Yeah, you know, if, if you think about um, back in 2014 and what was the, um, what was the most production ready databases that were available at that point? Um, we could not have used at that point in time, traditional SQL like systems because of the scale that we had even at that point in time. And the only option we had, which provided us some sort of scalable real time databases was no SQL kind of systems. Um, so, our app, so we were leveraging uh, Cassandra uh, uh, and the entire application that drives the state of the online orders, state of the driver sessions, all of the jobs, all of the waypoints, all of that has been, was stored uh, on in Cassandra. And over the last eight years, we have seen, you know, the kind of fulfillment use cases that we need to build that has changed a lot. So uh, whatever assumptions that we have made in our core data models and what kind of entities we can interact, it has completely changed. So we had to, if not anything else, change our application just for that reason. The second, because 
the entire application was designed with availability as the main requirement and latency was more of a best effort and consistency was more of a best effort mechanism whenever things went wrong it it made it really hard to debug for example like we don't want a scenario where if you request a ride two drivers show up at your pickup point because the system could not reconcile whether this trip was already assigned to a particular driver or it wasn't assigned to anyone and those were real problems that would happen if we don't have a consistent system and um, so the three prob three main areas of problems at the infrastructure layer at that point one is consistency that that i mentioned uh, already and because we didn't have any atomicity we had to make sure the system automatically reconciles and patches the data when things go out of sync based on what we expect the data to be um, there was a lot of scalability issues um, because we were getting to a best effort consistency we were using at the application layer some sort of hash ring and what we would do is oh let's get all of the updates for a given user routed to a same instance and have a queue in that instance so that even if our database is not providing consistency we have a queue of updates so we make sure there's only one update at any point in time that works when you have updates only in two entities so then at least you can do application level orchestration to ensure you know they might eventually get in sync but it doesn't scale beyond that and because you're using hash ring like we could not scale our cluster to beyond a vertical limit and that also inhibited our scale challenges and especially if we want like large cities that we want to handle we couldn't go beyond a certain scale Uh, so these were the key infrastructure problems that we had to like fundamental like we had to fix so that we can set ourselves up for the next uh, decade or two yeah makes sense so the, if, when the last update wins it may not be the most accurate update so yeah, yeah. yeah all right and then george when you and i were talking about this you said dave you know it might not just be scale it was sort of uber thinking about the future but elaborate on that george so uday what i wanted to know was like you guys had to think about a platform more broadly than just like drivers and riders because you had new verticals new businesses that you wanted to support and you know while the application layer manages things the database generally manages strings but the new capabilities in the database allowed you as you were describing to to think of like consistency differently and and latency but can you talk about also how you generalized the platform to support new businesses yeah uh, so that that's a that's a great question you know like uh, one of the things we had to make sure was as the kind of entities change within our system as we have to build new fulfillment flows we need to build a modular and leverageable system at the application layer at the end of the day we want the engineers building core applications and core fulfillment flows abstracted away from all of the underlying complexities around infrastructure scale provisioning latency consistency like they should get all of this for uh, for free and they don't need to think about it when they build something they get the right experience out of the box so what we had to do was at our programming layer we had a modular architecture where every entity like let's say there is a uh, order there is an order representation there's a merchant there's a there's a uh, user or a organization representation and we can assume, we can store these objects as individual tables and we can store the relationships between them as as a as a second as another table that stores the relationships between these objects so whenever new objects get into the system and whenever we need to introduce new relationships they are stored transactionally within our system um we 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 use the core database as uh, you can think of it as a um, transactional key value store uh, the, the database layer we still only store the key columns that we need and rest of the data is stored as a serialized blob um so that we don't have to continuously update the database anytime we add new attributes for a merchant or for a user uh, we don't we want to make reduce that operational overhead but at the high level every object is a table and then every relationship is a row in another table and then all, whenever new objects or relationships get introduced they are transactionally committed um dave i just want to add that th what's interesting is he just described yeah. an implementation of a semantic layer in the database 
Right, right. We've and, been talking about this uh, for months, George, and, and, and the importance of it. And, and I want to come back to that. Um, let's, let's help the audience understand at a high level today the critical aspects and principles of the new architecture. What we're showing here is a chart from Google Engineering in one of the blogs. And we want to understand how your approach, again, differs from your previous architecture. So, and you've touched on some of that. So the way we understand this is the green is the application layer, which is sort of in intermixed. The left-hand side uh, shows that. And on the right-hand side, you've separated the application services at the top from the data management below, and that's where Spanner comes in. So how should we understand this new architecture in terms of how it's different than the previous architecture? Yeah, so uh, in the previous architecture, we we went uh, we went through some of the details, right? Like the core data uh, was stored in Cassandra, and because we want to uh, have low latency reads, so we had a Redis cache as a backup whenever thing whenever Cassandra fails or whenever we want some uh, low latency uh, reads, and uh, we went through Ring Pop, which is the uh, application layer. Um, uh, shard management so that the requests get routed to the instance we need. And there was one pattern I didn't mention, which was on uh, Saga pattern, which was a paper uh, from a few decades ago. Ultimately, there was a point in time where the kind of transactions that we had to build, it evolved from just two objects. Like imagine a case of we want to have a concept of a batch offer, which means a single driver should accept multiple trips at the same time or not. Now you don't have now one each to one association. You have a single driver. I have maybe two trips, four trips, five trips, and you have some other object that is establishing this association. Now, if we need to now create a transaction across all of these objects, we tried using Saga as a pattern, extending our application layer transaction coordination. But again, it became even more complex because if things go wrong, we have to also write compensating actions. So that system is always in a state where they can proceed. We don't want users to get stuck and then not get new trips. So in the new architecture, like the key foundations we mentioned, one was around strong consistency. So um, and linear scalability. So the new SQL kind of databases provide that. And we left, we went through ex exhaustive evaluation uh, in 2018 across multiple choices we had. And at that point in time, we picked uh, Spanner as, uh, as, the, as the option. Um, and so we get, we move all of the transaction coordination and uh, scalability concerns at the at the database layer and at the application layer we focus on building the right programming model for building new fulfillment flows and the core transactional data is stored in spanner uh, we limit the number of rpcs that we go from our on prem data centers to google cloud because there it's a latency sensitive operation right and we don't want to have a lot of chatter between these two worlds um, and we have an on-prem cache, which is which will still provide you point in time um, snapshot reads across multiple entities so that they are consistent with each other. Uh, so for most use cases, they can read uh, they can read from the cache. And spanner is only used if I want strong reads for a particular object. And if I want cache reads across multiple objects, I go to my cache. If I want to search across multiple objects, then we have a, our own search system with, which is indexed on specific properties that we need so that if I want to get all of the nearby uh, orders that are currently not assigned to, you know, assigned to anyone, we can do that low latency search at scale. Um, and obviously we also emit Kafka events within Uber stack. So then we can build all sorts of near real time or OLAP applications. And then it's also go show raw tables. Then you can build more derived tables using Spark jobs. And but, but all of those things are happening within Uber's infrastructure. And we use Spanner for strong reads and core transactions that we want to commit across all of the entities and establishing those relationships that I mentioned. All right, so George, coming back to the sort of premise, this is how you've taken Uday, these business entities, drivers, riders, routes, ETAs, orders, and you've reconciled the, the, the trade-offs between latency, availability, and consistency. Would it be fair to say, Uday, that because you did such a good job matching between the things in the application and the things in the database, 
that you were able to inherit the transactional strengths of the database at both layers, at the database level and to simplify the that coordination at the application level. And that um, you also did something that people talk about but don't do much, which is a deep hybrid architecture where you had part of the application on-prem and part you know, using a Google service that you couldn't get elsewhere, often Google Cloud. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And then I think um, one more interesting uh, fact is how for most engineers, they don't even need to understand behind the scenes it's being powered by Spanner or any database. The, the guarantees that we provide to more application developers who are building you know, fulfillment flows is they have a set of entities and they say, hey, for this user action, these are the entities that need to be transactionally consistent and these are the updates I want to make to them. And then behind the scenes, our application layer leverages Spanner's transaction buffering, make updates to each and every entity. And then once all the updates are made, we commit so then all the uh, updates are uh, reflected in the in the storage so that the next strong read will see the latest update so the database decision obviously was very important we we're curious what was it about spanner that led you to that choice it's globally consistent it's a globally consistent database what about it made it easier for all the applications data elements to to share their status how did you you said you did a, a detailed evaluation how did you land on spanner yeah, you know, like any kind of choice requires a, a lot. There's a lot of dimensions that we uh, that we evaluate. Uh, but one is we wanted to build using a new SQL database um, because we want to have the mix of you know asset guarantees that uh, SQL systems provide and horizontal scalability that no SQL kind of systems provide and new SQL and building large scale applications using new SQL databases, like at least around the time when we started, that was still, we didn't have that many examples to choose from. Uh, even within Uber, we were kind of the first application for, for managing live orders using a new SQL based system. Um, but the specific properties that, you know, in some sense we need are uh, external consistency, right? Like I kind of mentioned, which is, uh, Spanner provides the strictest concurrency control guarantee for transactions so that when the transactions are committed in a certain order, any specific read after that, they see the latest data because that is very important because, you know, imagine we uh, assigned a particular uh, job to a specific uh, dri driver or courier and the next moment, if we see that, oh, this driver is not assigned to anyone, we might make wrong business decision and then assign you one more trip and that, that will lead to wrong outcomes. Um, and then horizontal scalability, uh, because Spanner automatically shards, uh, and then uh, it will rebalance the shards. And so then we, we have this horizontal scalability. In fact, we have our own auto scaler that listens to our load and Spanner signals and constantly adds new nodes and remove nodes because the traffic pattern Uber has changes based on time of the day, day uh, and then hour of the day. And then also day of the week, it's 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 very uh, curvy. So then we can make make sure we have the right number of um, nodes that are provisioned to handle the scale at that point in time. Um, I've kind of mentioned the server side transaction buffering uh, that was very important for us, so that we can have a modular application, so that each application, each entity that I'm representing, they can commit update to that entity independently and a layer above is coordinating across all of these entities. And once all of these entities have updated their part, then we can commit the overall transaction. So we can, so the trans, uh, transaction buffering on the server side helped us at the application layer to make it modular. You know, then uh, um, all the things around stale reads, point in time reads, bounded staleness reads, these help us build the right caching layer so that for most reads, uh, our cache hit rate probably is like on high 60, 70. So for most reads, we can go to our on-prem cache and only for um, when there's a cache miss or strong reads, we can go to our storage system. Um, so these were the key um, things. One, we want from new SQL and then uh, Spanner was the one because it, like with, with, uh, without the time to market because it's already uh, productionized and we can leverage SaaS solution. Uh, but 
all of these interactions are behind an ORM layer with the with the guarantees that we need. So this will help us, you know, like over time uh, figure out if we need to evaluate other options or not. But right now, uh, um, uh, for most developers, they don't need to understand what is powering behind the scenes. Yeah, and the and the the outcome for your customers is, is pretty remarkable. I mean, George and I, today were really interested, George was sort of alluding to this before, the aspects of the system that enable this coherency across all these data elements of, of the system that, that it has to manage. In other words, your ability to get agreement on the meaning of a driver, a rider, a price, et cetera, and, and, and how you design and achieve that layer to enable that coherence, that, that is tech that you had to develop, correct? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think um, there is there are many objects. Also, you know, we need to really think about what attributes of what a user sees in the app need to be coherent, and what can be can be kind of stale, but you don't necessarily notice because not everything need to have the same amount of guarantees, same amount of uh, um, uh, same amount of latency, and so on. Right, like so. If you think about some of the attributes that we manage, we talked about like the concept of orders. Uh, if, if a consumer places any intent, that is an order within a system. A single intent might require us to uh, decompose that intent into multiple sub objects. Like for example, if you place an Uber Eats order, there is one job for the restaurant to prepare the food and there is one job object for the courier to pick up and then drop off. Um, and when courier, job object like we have many waypoints which is the pickup waypoint drop off waypoint each waypoint can have its own set of uh, tasks that you need to perform like for example it could be taking a signature taking a photo paying at the uh, at the store uh, all sorts of tasks right and all of these are um, composable and leverageable so i can i can build new things using the same set of objects um, and if in any kind of marketplace we have supply and demand and we need to ensure there is a right kind of um, dispatching and matching paradigms. In some cases, you know, we are we assign we offer one job to one supply. In some cases, it could be M is to N. In some cases, it is blast to many uh, supplies. In some cases, they might see in a, some other is, is surface where these are all of the nearby jobs that you can potentially uh, handle. So. This kind of this is another set of objects which is super real time uh, because like when you when uh, a driver sees an offer card in the app, it goes away in thirty seconds and it, they need to 30, 40 seconds they need to make a decision and based on that we have to figure out the next step because you know within Uber's application we have changed users' expectation of how quickly we can perform things. If we are off by a few seconds, people will start canceling. Um, then Uber is hyper local. Then we have a lot of attributes around. Latitude, longitude, route line, driver's current location, our ETAs. These are probably like some of the hardest to get right because you know we constantly ingest the current driver location every four seconds. We have a lot of latitude, longitude. Like this throughput of this system could itself is like in hundreds of thousands of uh, updates per uh, per second. But not every update will require us to change. Um, the ETA, right? Like your ETA is not changing every four seconds. Uh, your route line is not changing every four seconds. So we do some magic behind the scenes to make sure that, okay, uh, have you crossed city boundaries? Only then we might require you to update something. Have you crossed some uh, product boundaries? Only then we require you to do some things. So we do that inferences to limit the number of updates that we are making to the core transactional system. And then we only store the data that we need, and then there's a complete parallel system that manages the whole pipeline of, you know, how we receive the driver side of equations and generate navigations and stuff for drivers, and then how we convert these updates and then show it on the rider app. That stream is completely decoupled from the core uh, orders and jobs, and uh, and you know if you think about Uber system, it's not just about building the business platform layer. Like we have a lot of our own sync infrastructure at the edge API layer, because we need to make sure all of the applications data is kept in sync. They're going through choppy network conditions. Um, they might be unreliable and we need to make sure that they get the updates as quickly as possible uh, as with low latency, irrespective of what kind of network condition they are in. So there's a lot of engineering challenges at that layer as well. Ultimately, all of this work in 
um, together to provide you the visibility that, hey, you know, I can exactly see what's going on. Uh, because if you're waiting for your driver, if they don't move, you might cancel assuming that, hey, they might not show up. And it's and we need to make sure that those updates flow through, not just through our system, but also from our system back to the rider app as quickly as possible. So hopefully we're, hey, George, you had a question? Yeah, this is, I mean, this is something new. We're on new territory, at least as far as Dave, what, what we've explored before. Right. What I'm taking away is that the, you're not just managing this, layer at the application where you you've got uber's entities or things but you're also and and translating that down to the database and the database is you know transactional semantics making it sort of easier to manage and orchestrate those things but what you're describing is something where the data's the data's sort of liveliness is an attribute that makes managing it separate separate from just mapping it down to the database you manage how it gets updated and how it gets um, communicated separately based on properties that are specific to each data element. And by data element, I mean property, not, not like a driver you know, or a courier. And that is interesting because Dave, just as a comment, Walmart talked about prioritizing data and you know, for, for communications from stores and the edge. Right. Um, and that may lead into an, a follow-on question. This is a, sorry for for the the long preamble, but the the question I have Uday is, what happens when you are orchestrating an ecosystem with ten or a hundred times as many things as you are now, and more data on all those things than you have now? Have you thought about what a world looks like where the centralized database may not be the central foundation? See, I think uh, that's where the trade-offs come in. We need to be really careful about not putting so much data in the core system that manages these entities and these relationships and overwhelmed with so much data that I think we'll, we'll probably hit some, then we'll end up hitting scale bottlenecks. You know, for example, um, if the fare item that you see both on the rider app or on the on the driver app, that item is made up of hundreds of line items with different business rules specific to different geos, different localities, different tax items. We don't store all of that in the core object. But one attribute for, for fair that we can uh, that we can leverage is a fair only changes if the core properties of riders object riders uh, requirements change. So every time the my, like you change your drop off, then we regenerate the fair. So I have one fair UID. Every time we regenerate, we create a new version of that fair and store these two UIDs along with the my core order object. So that I can store in a completely different system, my fair UID, fair version, and all of the data with all of the line items, all of the context that we use to generate that line items, because that what we need to save transactionally is the fair version UID when we uh, save the order. We don't need to save all of the fair attributes along with that. So these are some design choices that we do to make sure that you know we limit the amount of data that we store for these entities. In some cases, we might store the data. In some cases, we might version the data and then store along with that. In some cases, if it is okay to tolerate that data and it, it, it doesn't need to be coherent with the core orders and jobs, it can be saved in a completely different uh, story online storage and then we have at the presentation layer where we generate the ui screen there we can enrich this data and then generate the screen that we need um, so all of this will make sure that we limit the scale of growth of the core transactional system and then we leverage other systems that are more suited for the specific needs of uh, those data attributes but still all of them tie into the order object and then there's some association that we maintain. So this is really important. I want to, we're going to actually revisit this as a guide to the future. Uh, uh, but so I just want to take a pause and reset here and kind of hopefully the audience understands that what Uber has built is different, of course, than conventional apps. We tried to sort of put this together in a slide to describe the sort of 3.0 apps. Uh, if, if Alex, you'd bring up the next one. Um, so starting at the bottom, 
you have the platform resources and then the data layer to provide that single version of the truth and then the application services that govern and orchestrate the digital representations of the real world entities, drivers, riders, packages, et cetera. And that all supports what the customer sees in the Uber app. So the big difference from the cloud stack that we all know and love is, you know, Uber's not selling us compute or storage. We don't even see that. Rather, Uber's offering up things, access to drivers and merchants and services. And so, Uday, where are the lines between sort of your thinking and commercial off the shelf software that you were able to use and versus the IP that Uber had to develop itself to achieve these objectives. Can you describe sort of that, that thinking and what went into that build versus buy? Yeah, in general, um, we rely on a lot of open source technologies, um, commercial off the shelf software, and in some cases, in-house developed uh, solutions. Ultimately, it depends on you know the kind of specific use case, time to market, maybe you want to optimize for cost, um, optimize for maintainability, all of these factors come into picture um, for the app, the core orders and the core fulfillment system. We talked about Spanner and how we leverage that uh, with some specific guarantees. We use Spanner for even our identity use cases where we want to manage, you know, especially in large organizations, you want to make sure your business rules, your AD groups, your stuff, and how we capture that for our consumers that has to be in sync. Um, but there is a lot of other uh, services across microservices across Uber that leverage uh, Cassandra uh, if, if their use case is uh, high right throughput. And we leverage Redis for, uh, for all kinds of caching needs. We leverage HCD and Zookeeper for low level infrastructure platform uh, storage needs. Um, and we also have a system that is built on top of MySQL. Um, with a RAF-based algorithm called DocStore. So for majority of the use cases, that is our go-to solution where it, it provides you shared local transactions and it's a multi-model database. So it's, it's useful for most kind of use cases and it's optimized for cost because uh, we manage the stateful layer, we manage uh, and we deploy it on, uh, on our nodes. So for most applications, that will give us the balance of cost and efficiency and for applications that need the strongest level of requirements where like fulfillment or identity where we use Spanner, for high ride throughput, we use Cassandra. And beyond this, you know, if you think about uh, uh, our metric system, uh, one of, M3DB, it's an open source uh, software, open sourced by, uh, uh, by Uber, uh, contributed to the community a few years ago. It's a time series database. Uh, like we ingest millions of uh, metric data points per second, and we had to build something on our own. And now, uh, it, now it's an active community, and there's a bunch of other companies leveraging M3DB for metric storage. Um, so ultimately, it's you know, in some cases we might have built something uh, and open sourced it. In some cases, we leverage off the shelf. Uh, in some cases, we use completely open source and like I know contribute some new features. Um, for example, for uh, for Data Lake. Uber pioneered uh, Apache Hoodie back in 2016 and contributed. So then we have one of the largest transactional data uh, lake uh, with maybe 200 plus petabytes of data um, um, that we manage. Got it. Okay, uh, this next snippet that we're going to share comes from an ETR roundtable, which is our data partner, um, and they do these private roundtables. Uh, we'll pull it up and I'll read the quote from a pretty famous technical guru who's going to remain unnamed only because I'm not sure I have permission to name this individual, but he, sa he says, everybody in the world is thinking about real-time data and whether it's Kafka specifically or something that looks like Kafka, real-time stream processing is fundamental. When people talk about data-driven businesses, they very quickly come to the realization that they need real-time because that's where there's more value. Architectures built for batch don't do real-time well. Person mentioned cockroach, said it's super exciting. I feel weird endorsing a small startup, he said, but Google Spanner is amazing. And cockroach is the closest thing that you could actually buy off the shelf and run yourself rather than be married to a managed service from a single cloud vendor. So Uday, you know, a couple of questions here. Um, I'm curious as to how you changed the engine in mid flight, uh, going from the previous architecture, you know, pre 2014 and post, um, and it's, you know, George mentions what happens when real time overwhelms the centralized database's ability to manage all this data in real time. And it sounds like you architected at least 
quite a, a, a runway to avoid that. But talk about two questions there. How'd you change the engine in mid-flight and when do you see it running out of gas? Yeah, uh, you know, the, the, the first question, you know, one of the things I, uh, I think is there's designing a new greenfield system is one thing, but moving from whatever you have to that green, greenfield system is 10x harder and the complex, the, the hardest engineering challenges that we had to solve was for how we go from A to B without impacting any real, any user. We don't have the luxury to do a downtime where, hey, you know, we're going to shut off Uber for an hour and then let's do this migration behind the scenes. And then we went through, the previous system was using Cassandra with, a, with some in-memory queue. And then the new system is strongly consistent. How do you go from the, the core database guarantees are different. The application APIs are different. So what we had to build was a proxy layer um, that um, for any user request, we have a backward compatibility. So then uh, we shadow what is going to the old system and new system. But then because the properties of what transaction gets committed in old and new are also different, it's, it's extremely hard to even shadow and get the right metrics for us to get the confidence. Um, but ultimately, um, so that is the shadowing part. And then we, what we do is, what we did was uh, we tagged a particular driver and a particular uh, order that gets created, whether it's created in the old system or new system. And then we kind of gradually migrate all of the drivers and orders from old to new. So there would be at a point in time, you might be seeing that marketplace is kind of uh, split where half of those orders and earners are in the old, half of them are in the new. And then once all of the orders are moved, we switch over the state of remaining earners from old to new. So one, we had to do a lot of uh, unique challenges on shadowing and two, uh, we had to do a lot of unique tricks to make sure that we give the perception of there is no downtime and then move that state um, without losing any context, without losing any jobs in flight and so on. Uh, so, and then if there is a uh, driver who's currently completing a trip in the old stack, we let that complete, complete. And the moment they are done with that trip, we switch them to the new stack so that um, their state is not transferred midway through a trip. And so then once you create new trips and new earners through new and then switch them after complete the trip, we have a safe point to migrate. You know, this is similar to uh, like 10 years ago, I was at VMware and like we used to work on how do you do uh, vMotion, like virtual machine yeah. migration from one most other host. This was kind of like that kind of challenge. What is the point at which you can, you can move the state uh, without having any application uh, impact? Uh, so those are kind of the tricks that we had to uh, do. Um, and the second question, and how do we make sure we don't run out of gas? You know, we kind of went through that, right? Like um, one, uh, obviously we are doing uh, our own scale testing, our own projected testing to make sure that we are constantly ahead of our growth and make sure the system can scale. And then we are also very diligent about uh, looking at the properties of the data, choosing the right technology um, so that we limit the amount of data that we store for that system and then use um, specific kind of uh, systems that are catered to those use cases. Like for example, like all of the uh, our matching system, it, if it wants to query all of the nearby jobs and nearby supplies, we don't go to the transactional system to query that. We have our own inbuilt search platform where we are doing real time ingestion of all of this data using CDC. And then like, so, and then we have all kinds of rankers so that we can do real time on the fly generation of all of the jobs, because the more context you have, the better marketplace optimization we can make. And that can give you the kind of um, efficiency at scale, right? Uh, the, otherwise we'll not, we'll make imperfect decisions, which will hurt the overall marketplace uh, efficiency. Yeah, and in your blog post, you had said that you had to build this architecture to support your business for the next decade. So it, you, you, it, from inferring, you don't see any, at least in the near term, all these data elements and all this real-time data overwhelming uh, the system because of the way you've architected it. Is that a fair assertion? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think you're confident, at least um, like, you know, for the foreseeable future, uh, what we have is a stable foundation. And you know, since then, 
you could see the kind of new use cases that we are building right like you know like uber reserve now you can reserve 30 days in advance now we are entering into grocery we are doing uh, where a courier is going and then shopping for you we are doing um, recently we have seen announcements on party city on pet smart like so we want to make sure that we can um, you know, go anywhere and get anything we can unbundle every use case uh, that you need a car for and then provide a, a, a affordable scalable transportation solution so that we can handle all of your mobility needs on demand at scale at your fingertips and then we can capture every single merchant in the world and then capture it in our system every single catalog every single item manage relationships across all of them we have millions and millions of catalog items around the world and then so that you can go and get anything that you need um, whether it is a food whether it's a alcohol whether it is uh, some party item whether it's some pet food whether it's convenience whether it's pharmacy everything is handled uh, so that is uh, um, so we we at least right now uh, at least i'm confident that we can scale to those needs and then we have the system uh, that can scale to that needs right you know last question george and i have been sort of look into the future, using Uber as an example of the future. So what do you see coming or what do you hope to see if you think about just a broader industry with respect to commercial tools over the next say three to five years that might make it dramatically easier for a mainstream company that doesn't necessarily have Uber's technical bench and depth to build this type of application um, in particular, how, how might other companies that need to manage hundreds of thousands of digital twins design their applications using more off the shelf technology? Do, do you expect that will be possible in, let's call it the, the midterm future? Yeah, you know, I think um, the whole landscape around uh, developer tools, applications, it's, it's a rapid evolving space. You know, what was possible um, now was not possible five years ago and like it's constantly changing. Um, but what we see is, you know, we need to provide value at upper layers of the stack, right? And then wherever, if there is some solution that can provide something off the shelf, we, we move to that. So then we can focus up the layer. Like it's not just building, taking off the shelf IAS or past solutions, just taking the sheer complexity of representing configuration, representing the geo diversity around the world, and then building something that can work for any use case in any country, uh, adhering to those specific local rules. Th that is what I see is like the core strength of Uber. Like we can manage any kind of pay uh, payment disbursements or payments uh, in, in the world. Uh, we have the largest support for many payment, like any payment method around the world. For earners, we are dispersing like billions of uh, um, payouts to whatever bank account and whatever payment method they need money in. Um, we have a risk system that can handle nuance use case around risk and fraud. Uh, our system around fulfillment that's managing this, our system around maps that is managing all of the ground through tolls, surcharges, uh, navigation, all of that. So we have probably one of the largest global map stack where we manage our own navigation, uh, and leveraging some data from external providers. Um, so this is the like the core IP and core business strength of Uber, and that is what is allowing us to do many verticals. But again, the 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 systems that I can use to build this, that over time, absolutely, I see. You know, it, it makes it easier for many companies to leverage this. Maybe 15 years ago, we didn't have Spanner. Uh, so it was much harder to build this now uh, with Spanner or with similar new SQL, other of the shelf uh, databases, it, it solves one part of the challenge, but then now we need to uh, think about like the other uh, center, uh, other layer of the challenge. I am so excited that you were able to come on George because uh, Uday was able to come on because George, you and I have been talking about this as the future and uh, just, I think they just solidified it, but we're, I think George, we set a new record for breaking analysis in terms of time, but, uh, but uh, George, what are your takeaways? Anything last words that you would have to add before we break? I think the takeaways are, I think this is one of those applications that people will look back on many years from now and say, you know, that really um, was the foundation for a new way of doing business, not just of building software, but of doing business. Like Amazon was the first one to manage their own internal processes, you know, where they're orchestrating the people, places, and things 
with an internal platform, but you guys did it for an external ecosystem and, you know, made it accessible to con consumers, you know, in real time. Um, and I think the biggest question I, I have, and it's, it's not really one that you can answer, but it's one that we'll have to see the industry answer is to what extent the industry will make technology, make it possible for mainstream companies to start building their own Uber platforms to manage their own ecosystems. That's, that's my, my takeaway and my question. Yeah, so, okay, we're going to leave it there. <laughs> Ude, <laughs> thanks so much. I really appreciate uh, your time and your insights um, and love to have you back. Yeah, absolutely. Anytime, ring me up, I'll be there. <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks, Ude. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure talking to both of you today uh, and on, uh, on, on being on Baking Analysis. Uh, yeah. soon. Fantastic. On behalf of George Gilbert, I want to thank Uday and his team for these amazing insights on the past, present, and future of data-driven apps. Well, I also thank Alex Meyerson, who's on production and manages the podcast, Ken Schiffman as well. Kristen Martin and Cheryl Knight helped get the word out on social media and in our newsletters. And Rob Hof is our editor-in-chief over siliconangle.com. Thank you so much, everybody. Remember, all these episodes are available as podcasts. All you got to do is search Breaking Analysis Podcast pop in the headphones, go for a long walk on this one. I publish each week on wikibon.com and siliconangle.com. You can email me directly at david.vellante at siliconangle.com, at dvellante to DM me or comment on our LinkedIn posts. And check out etr.ai. They got great survey data on enterprise tech. This is Dave Vellante for theCUBE Insights powered by ETR. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time on Breaking Analysis. <laughs>